So last but not least, we're going to welcome um, Dr. Rajadis, and I'm going to have you, I'm going to make sure you can start your video. I know I had stopped that at one point. Um, and so we are so grateful to, to have um, Dr. J um, um, here. Um, he has been uh, such an important and kind soul and inspiration to my family personally. Um, so um, when Dr. Spector was unable to join us because um, he is battling illness himself right now, um, Dr. Rajadis is actually um, on the front lines right now dealing with the COVID-19 virus and all the other things that he does to try to help people save lives and change lives. And he still took time a week uh, away um, from this and said, yes, Heather, I will do this. Um, and so I had the joy and pleasure, um, Logan and I both, to meet Dr. Um, Jay at um, a Live Lyme VIP reception um, a few years back when um, my boys were still very, very sick. Um, and he took the time to sit on a couch for hours talking to my son um, at that reception. And um, then he invited us to his lab and um, Logan got to go shadow him in his lab in Stanford while I was working um, in Stanford with a client for my other paid job. And Logan left that lab after shadowing um, him for the day and his people and said, these people are going to save lives. They're going to change lives. And so um, to end our day, um, I am so grateful to be able to introduce you um, to this wonderful man and soul and um, blessing to our community and the fact that he was able to squeeze us in um, and, and do this, uh, we are so grateful for. So I'm handing it over to you for more information too about all the research he's doing. Um, you can go to Stanford and check out his profile and biography as well. So if you want to hear all the, all the um, fantastic publications and things he's done, but I just thought I'd go with a heart on this one and just talk about how much um, you mean to us in the community. So. Thank you very much. Uh, so you're going to uh, flash the slides either? Um, I do not have um, have the slides, um, so um, uh, I don't believe you send it's them. It's in your uh, email actually. Okay, oh great, let me pull those up. Um, just one moment uh, and I'll stop the video and grab that. Just why Heather's in the middle of doing that. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajadas. Thank you, thank you. So appreciative, like Heather said. Um, I was there at Live Line Summit and um, I was quite jealous that Heather got a chance to go chat with you. I don't know, I must have been somewhere else, um, but I missed that opportunity. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing from you again. I, I just also really quickly while Heather's finding those slides, I wanted to thank um, again, Dr. Smith, because um, much of what he showed in the presentation is is what we've discussed for the several years since Samantha was in treatment with him and since then. Um, so I love the way that he's able to approach that whole wellness and I hope that everyone got a lot from that. Um, when he talked about HBOT, I know a lot of people have asked me in the past about how Samantha did with hyperbaric oxygen therapy and just briefly, um, Therapy is different from, from person to person. And so in no way, shape or form do I advocate that this is the way to go. And as you saw in his slides, there are several different ways a person can go. But I just will let you know that it was good for Sam and that she did find movement after all of the parts sort of came together. So that's just sort of my sum up of why HBOT was really good with her response. I see Heather is back up there. I'm gonna tell you to get those slides going. Thanks guys, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, I think we have your slides going. Yeah, uh, thanks, Heather. Thanks uh, for this opportunity uh, to come and then uh, share some of our uh, experience in developing uh, therapeutics for uh, Lyme disease. Um, so uh, maybe we are all in the middle of another big war. Uh, when I first visited the um, US about uh, almost 22 years ago, I went and then saw uh, the you know uh, Washington Memorial. In the memorial, I was so surprised to see uh, the quote of uh, George Washington, which says, "For 
any peace, uh, you know, there needs to be a war. <laughs> I was so surprised that, um, yeah, you know, the war is kind of essential to get us into peace because we need to recognize that we are in war. Uh, we are not uh, with war, you know, in olden days, we are used to be war with uh, some very macro-sized uh, mammals. And uh, obviously we kind of got a victory. That's why we can tame them, them. And then in fact, sometimes we use them also for our purpose. But uh, currently, uh, you know, the, the war, so you can see the dinosaurs and when you compare, uh, you know, we, we can manage those kind of uh, uh, animals. But the smaller the enemy, more dangerous they are. Uh, in fact, you know, the, the bacteria and the, including the spirochete bacteria, bacteria, uh, you know, uh, Borrelia. And also, uh, right now, you know, we are dealing with coronavirus, which is also uh, very small and it is easily spread. Uh, fortunately, Borrelia never spread in that way. There are bacteria that uh, spread through air in the air, 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 aerosolized in the way like TB bacteria spread. Uh, so these small enemies like, you know, uh, nano-sized, you know, in enemy in the case of virus and in micron-sized enemy in the case of Borrelia, they are kind of the enemies we need to have a perfect war at this point. So when you have a war that you have a different set of, uh, uh, you know, we need a resources to fight this war. The major one, I think, you know, I am trained with the more, most on pharmaceutical end. So we focus on developing molecules to equip, uh, uh, you know, many of us, uh, some of us are victims, some of us are the family of the victims, but all of us are in, in this process of, uh, you know, trying to be involved in, uh, the, in participating the war. And uh, so the next slide. Next slide, yeah. So, uh, you know, the, generally the small molecules, uh, pharmaceutical interventions are not, uh, in all the time we are taking, uh, we think, you know, we are, uh, we don't think about those molecules very seriously uh, because uh, we are in a situation where uh, we have plenty of molecules available, especially for antibiotic treatment, uh, you know, for antimicrobial treatment. What the person you see is, a, I mean, you know him, it's an Alexander uh, Fleming. In fact, I'm just, to, you know, picking a poster where during the Second World War time, where they say, thanks to penicillin, he will come home. That means penicillin saved more people, like, uh, during... Uh, more than the people killed in both the two world war. So much in a single discovery made such a big impact on people's life. Uh, it changed the economy, it changed everything. A single discovery, a single observation by uh, uh, Sir uh, uh, Alexander Fleming. And that the development is such a, in a quick phase uh, that, you know, uh, simultaneously a lot of groups involved in making manufacturing and then saving people. And we are in that kind of situation now. We need to develop antivirals, uh, you know, maybe if possible within a month. Within two months, we need to prepare something to save people, you know, thousands and thousands of people. And not only people, and also our economy. We need to save people, we need to save our economy. So we are in a kind of emergency situation. And we, uh, not only for the coronavirus therapy, we are also, you know, part of an another war. Uh, this war is not a, a, like, a, uh, like a coronavirus war. It is much more a painful uh, war, at least in coronavirus war, war everybody recognizes the war. The war uh, involving Lyme disease uh, therapy, it's kind of not well appreciated what people still believe uh, that Lyme disease therapy is already resolved with the doxycycline treatment, everything is okay. 
and of course it's not now slowly people are realizing everything is not okay about 20 percent of the patients i even after the treatment uh, they come back with uh, lingering symptoms and then when we started this project almost uh, eight years ago we wanted to focus on developing a novel antibiotics uh, to people so that they will not come back with the lingering sim symptoms they they will uh, you know we try to focus on perfect cure and not uh, you know a best treatment so that people are treated with, uh, uh, with this molecule novel molecule so that they will not come back not only that even if they have a chronic disease we don't know why they de develop a disease either it may be due to persistent bacteria or it may be due to in in uh, you know immune dysfunction whatever the cause is we thought we will try to find a molecule so uh, we need to develop the resources for that so the first stage when we got some funding in 2012 uh, we thought uh, you know we will go for so th this is the first slide i just wanted to uh, put it because without funding nothing is possible so we just wanted to start with uh, you know thanking my mentors uh, dr kenneth liner one of the clinicians maybe many of you know is the one first observed the therapeutic effect of diesel from antabuse and then reported to the world and also my friend uh, dan uh, kinderlehner he is also very supportive of research most importantly our uh, uh, lyme disease working group uh, director dr mark davis uh, he is also very supportive of re our research the most important people is the bionio media foundation uh, yeah, recently uh, started foundation supporting lyme research the Bay Area Lyme Foundation for a very, I mean, for a few years, they supported us like 2012 to 2016. And of course, Live Lyme also supported us for two years, 2016 and 2017. And now who is supporting mainly uh, independent donors, uh, like for example, Christina Bauer, Beverly Murphy, Jose Moyes, and Joseph Kulandai. So you can have innumerable of people they are supporting us. They, in fact, there are donors uh, uh, every month they are sending uh, some money to our lab. I really take this opportunity to thank all of them, uh, you know, for helping us to develop these molecules for the use of uh, uh, Lyme community. The next slide, please. So this is the team uh, involved in it. Uh, the first, uh, the, the top photograph, you see my entire lab because we also uh, uh, develop a lot of therapy for other indication, neurological and also heart uh, disease related uh, uh, therapeutic development. Most importantly, like 40% of my people, my lab, uh, like uh, Dr. Ravindra Potanini, Jahana Banu Jayashree, Harihara Potula and Rayafedin Ahmed, they are involved in uh, Lyme disease research, developing resources and developing molecules. The next slide, please. Yes, so um, resources is very, very important. Uh, it, without resources, it's very, very difficult to uh, develop anything uh, to find out. In fact, the, the, the person you see in this slide, his name is Ronald Ross. Ronald Ross got a Nobel Prize for the discovery that he found out uh, how malaria spreads, especially in India, when he was stationed there as a army uh, scientist, he took an opportunity. He was having, holding a, a very, very, uh, not a very great microscope, but he just uh, used that microscope and tried to collect samples from patients. He used to allow the pa you know, malarial patients to be bitten by the mosquitoes and collect those mosquitoes, try to dissect them painfully. You used to dissect them to find out uh, whether they have any parasites because the, the discovery that happened there he, sh he showed that malaria, malaria is spread by mosquito is a very, very important discovery. And again, you know, the, the first therapeutic uh, advice that came because of his discovery that is kind of you have to separate yourself, you have to 
so from the mosquito so that you can avoid this disease in fact similar thing is happening now we just go for a quarantine so the world got this first therapeutic idea of quarantining themselves from the malaria carrying vectors that mosquitoes is because of this man because this man got you know developed some resources microscopic resources for his amazing discovery he got nobel prize so um, again malarial parasites as you all of known it's very very small you know micro it's a very small sized parasites they are uh, you know get into the red cells and then they feed the hemoglobin and they spread so do we have what is what about the size of the borrelia in this slide you in, you know you see yeah, a green uh, fluorescent borrelia it's a, a kind of spring sized borrelia it is much smaller than a big nucleus what you see and also the cell and but still it is some a few micron sized uh, organism you know it's not very small but uh, just a few micron a kind you know you can definitely look at them in a light microscope in the way uh, ronald ross saw the uh, malarial uh, parasites we can definitely look at them but it is much more than that what we found out like this bacteria it is not only its entire body is causing the disease by getting into a different part of the uh, people uh, you know or organism it is also shelling out a lot of yeah, nano sized vesicles in the, the top the, the electron microscopic picture taken by dr ravindra potanini you can see that a uh, lot of borrelia uh, you know, it's uh, you can see the space bar there. It's one micron. A lot of borrelia. You also see a lot of small, small, small lipidic vesicles that comes out. That means it's almost like a you know, bore, you know, coronavirus infected person when he sneezes out. There is aerosolized particles carrying the virus is going everywhere. Same way, the borrelia it shells out lot of lipidic particles around them. So the lipidic particles travel to the bloodstream. It causes the disease. It goes to the brain and causes the disease. You know, I beautifully explained by our previous speaker. Uh, it is going everywhere, especially in the brain. And we recently published a paper. Anybody interested, you can write an email. I can send you a copy of the paper where we, you know, it got published in Journal of Neuroscience, we just uh, developed a smaller vesicles, like the shell out borrelial vesicles. We took the vesicles, we treated the uh, uh, animals with these vesicles, and then we show how the neuronal dysfunctions happens. So that means the causative agent, not only the borrelia, the causative agent is the borrelial lipidic particle that comes out of it or comes out of borrelia that is also covered in fact one of the some of the researchers they showed you take a bore you know people with the chronic disease you take their blood and then you centrifuge them and then you can always you know in that serum you can um, you can separate this vesiculated protein because they circulate for very long time in people's body and then still continuously causing the disease. We don't know whether these particles are responsible for the persistent disease, but one thing what we found out when you treat, take these particles and then treat with the neurons, cultures of the lab or treat with other immune cells, they do uh, uh, you know, cause a lot of damages to the cells. They, you, know, you also see yeah, the synaptic damage because of this particle that was the kind of main theme of our paper published in Journal of Neuroscience. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll go back to the next slide. Yes, so we need to, you know, of course, many of you know this. Um, I just wanted to explain uh, the log phase and stationary phase, what it means. The log, uh, you know, generally when you take a bacterial culture, um, you know, you just put it in a culture medium, it takes some time uh, for it to start doubling because they need to bacteria need to adopt the new nutrition medium you are providing then they will start doubling it they start dividing them so in a log phase they divide very fast in fact 
the typical coronavirus spread is now it's in the log phase. It's exponential. You know, it's not like additive, like, like two, yesterday it was just a 10, a one, you know, one, today it's two, tomorrow four, not like that. It is in exponential form, very fast, uh, you know, very rapid div uh, dividing or, uh, 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 you know, uh, spreading disease. And a similar way, this log phase is yeah, very rapidly dividing. And then we get into late log phase. That means it's kind of, uh, the, you know, the bacteria, they have a limited, started feeling the limited amount of the, um, the nutrition. And then the stationary phase, you have a lot of dense bacteria is there. Obviously, there's a depletion of the nutrient that is available for the bacteria and the bacteria will start you know almost it maintains its density that means some of them divide some of them die so there is a kind of a maintenance so we call it as a stationary phase the stationary phase is very very interesting because stationary phase it's very difficult to totally destroy stationary phase. Why? Because stationary phase, you see a bacterial population, they are kind of antibiotic risk. I mean, you can't call them a resistant, but you can call them a kind of persistence. That means they try to adapt themselves to live in an extreme condition. So they kind of uh, develop a phenotype change and then phenotype change makes them to survive even in even in adverse condition the next slide please now this is one you know this idea of uh, persistence this idea of stationary phase uh, survival is one kind of understanding we develop of course we also need a mice model we we call it as a in vivo uh, thing like we because mice, normal wild type mice, they generally, you know, they are one of the carriers like deer and other animals. If you have a lot of squirrels, if you have a lot of wild type mice in your garden, then, you know, these are all the animals which basically they are like um, coronavirus uh, carriers, with asymptomatic carriers, they always spread the disease. But they never get the disease at all. Like for example, they never get the inflammation, brain inflammation. They never get a brain fog or they never develop an arthritis. Somehow, uh, wild type mice, they develop a system so that they can adapt itself or live along with the bacteria very comfortably. So we, but we can't use these mice because these mice, they are okay. They, they, they don't have any disease. They, for example, you leave them, for a few months after borrelial infection, they never develop an arthritis. But people do develop arthritis. You know, if you are not treating the Lyme disease patients after a few years, they develop arthritis. But uh, so we need to develop a mo uh, um, animal model which can not only get infected and at the same time, they need to develop disease like a human. So we, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, Jackson's, you know, the, the uh, facility which uh, uh, they sell uh, animals, they developed a, a model, which they call, we call it a C3H. And this animal, they have a mutation in TLR, one of the receptor, and they develop disease. They develop arthritis. They develop the neuronal problem, as we see in, uh, you know, people. So we... Uh, you are using like other researcher this particular animal model. So, and then we infect them and then we treat them with uh, antibiotic and we try to find out uh, whether the antibi you know, antibiotic is totally clearing the Borrelia in their body. How we do? So, after treating uh, the Bor Borrelia with them, we are injecting Borrelia to these animals. And then we, after some time, uh, with the antibiotic, without antibiotic, we take their, uh, uh, you know, uh, the urinary bladder because most of the Borrelia get, uh, you know, deposited there. And also we try to find out the 
presence of Borrelia in the air lobes, and uh, be particularly interested in the whether the Borrelia get into the heart, developing heart inflammation. We are also interested in the brain, whether they cause brain inflammation, whether either the Borrelia by physical presence or by just uh, the brain, if it absorbs a lot of the lipidic particle that is shelled out by this peripheral tissue uh, um, uh, residing borrelia after the chronic infection. So these are all the ideas uh, and then these are all the resources uh, we use to develop a much better uh, antibiotic than what conventionally people use it to treat. Uh, so our aim is basically not to have this 20%, maybe just 2% instead of 20%. We wanted to reduce the people with the lingering system, uh, you know, symptoms. That's our focus. And uh, so the, we just is developed all these um, resources to check. And then ne what the next step? Next step is we just started from the beginning because we don't want to assume that whether the doxycycline is good or other things is good. So we just uh, uh, get hold of some easily FDA approvable or already approved molecules. Uh, we wanted to screen those molecules. We picked some 8,000 molecules. The way we do is, next slide please. Yeah, so the way we do is we just uh, have the pre-coated plate with a different concentration of these molecules. And then we, we grow the bacteria in the plates where there is already a drug there. We just coat them. And then this, uh, you know, when they, the back, and then we check whether the bacteria grow or not after incubating it. We wanted to find out how long, whether they grow. Uh, how do we know whether they are alive or not? Uh, because we check their ATP level. If they still are metabolically active, they shell out a molecule called ATP. And this molecule is kind of energy currency. It's something, you know, like if people, how active they are, if you wanted to find out, they will try to find out their credit card transactions, right? Because money show that how active people are. Uh, so we wanted to see uh, whether the Borrelia is alive or not by just measuring the amount of ATP they generate in the plate. So thousands and thousands of uh, uh, molecules already pre-deposited in a different concentration, treated with uh, live Borrelia, which is uh, having an ability, this, uh, you know, then we add a reagent to find out how much energy currency, that is ATP, is coming out of those individual wells we call. And if they have more ATP, then we know the drug is ineffective. It is not clearing or killing the bacteria. If it is dark, nothing comes out of it. Uh, you know, there is no ATP because how we measure the ATP? We measure the ATP by, you know, maybe you, you have um, uh, watched the firefly. So we just uh, generate a reagent. You see, it's called a luciferase. And this is a reagent it is designed in a way, it just utilizes ATP and uh, magnesium. With the presence of ATP and magnesium, it uh, processes uh, luciferin, uh, and then the luciferin become an yeah, oxidized product that generate light. So the light which you see in the firefly. So that means the wells will be acting as a firefly if there is an ATP. If there is no ATP, then you know it is dark. Nothing is visible. So, by so we have an automatic readers, robotic readers, and then they see, they screen all these compounds. They find out any ATP is coming out. If more ATP is coming out, then we just discard those molecules. If the molecules are killing, then you have be allowed to see lot of dark spot in this, you know, uh, light emitting. Uh, the plates. And uh, we are very fortunate to have, you know, found out some about max, you know, like top 
50 candidates first. And then finally, we, uh, check, you know, we selected about 20. And then we started working on those 20. In the next slide, please. Yeah, so next slide. Yeah, we, I already explained this to you. Yes. So before uh, uh, you know, going to the uh, the the our high throughput screening, I, there is also an another way of screening which we call the in silico screening. In fact, nowadays for coronavirus, we don't have resources, right? Uh, because this virus is a novel virus. We don't have animal models. We don't have uh, you know cell culture system uh, to screen molecules. So same thing we got into this kind of situation like 2012 when we started the project. At that time, because of my biophysics background, we started uh, screening using computers. Try to identify uh, molecules by computers in this uh, uh, Borrelia and try to see whether we can target these molecules. Uh, then we found out, of course, other people publish in the literature that Borrelia is kind of smart organism. It just, uh, you know, all of us, we use extensively iron uh, for uh, to handle some oxidative stress in this, our cells. We develop, you know, we have a, a SOD kind of uh, enzymatic molecules that can take care of this stress. But Borrelia uh, is kind of having a different mechanism. Instead of iron, we, you know, people found out it used manganese. Uh, so that means if you have a lot of borrelia load in your body, because it is utilizing manganese instead of iron, then you know, there will be a lot of areas where there will either the manganese will go, you know, borrelia will found out the way to take the extract manganese from your tissues or you know, there will be a lot of depletion in the manganese wherever Borrelia is there, where there is more Borrelia load. So this, uh, people observed it, and then with the molecular biology manipulations, they developed the mutants. They have a problem because there are specific protein called BMTA, and this BMTA protein, they are transporting manganese to the Borrelia. So that, that means that this, they carry, they just to extract manganese from outside in the tissue and then transport that manganese for Borrelia use. So researchers developed a mutant that have a different ability for this. So we targeted this particular uh, uh, mo you know, molecule. Why? Because, uh, you know, it's kind our mammalian cells, they don't have a similar mechanism. So that means we can develop something that can block this manganese transport for Borrelia and then Borrelia dies. So that's our idea. And it was very interesting molecules for us to work. So we try to screen with several FDA molecules and then try to find out any molecule can block this transport. And uh, to our, uh, you know, when, when we finished the, our thing, we started looking at those molecules very carefully. Uh, we found out one of the FDA uh, uh, approved molecule, uh, it's called uh, Laratidine. Laratidine is uh, the allergy medication you take. And then we found out this molecule, unfortunately, at only at high concentration, uh, it is definitely, um, stopping the dividing. Of course, it is kind of killing uh, the Borrelia. Uh, that's very interesting. Then we, we took, we got this uh, mutant bacteria, Borrelia, that is having a problem, already problem in using uh, manganese. And this bacteria, it, they have a deficiency in using manganese. At the same time, you know, in this kind of extreme condition, Borrelia also having a kind of alternative mechanism to use iron in the case of manganese, but their growth is much, much, uh, you know, less than a normal wild type. So if our hypothesis is right, if we halt the borreal growth, then with the mutant, the BMTA deficient mutant, 
it should not have any effect on it. Uh, that's that's exactly what happened. And uh, you know, we we to our surprise, we found out in fact the first year you see a vehicle, a desilaritin, and we always compare it with doxycycline, the molecule which uh, you know at least in a dish it kills Borrelia very well, and then. Uh, it is not like a doxycycline. Unfortunately, we expected to be a doxycycline, but it is okay. It is killing at higher concentrations. So we are kind of focused on redesigning this molecule so that we will, it will behave exactly like uh, doxycycline. But if you see the other uh, three mutants we saw, that is O, Y, O, 7, F, 6, 2, uh, you know, similarly, the other uh, names, what you see in B, C, D, this uh, bacteria, they don't have, they have an impaired uh, ability to process uh, the manganese. They can't take the manganese. And these bacteria, they are okay. They are not, you know, totally get, getting eradicated, uh, you know, when we are treated with loratidine. So our hypothesis looks okay. But we do have some molecule which is at higher concentration. If it is definitely uh, inhibiting the growth of bacteria, so we published this paper. The purpose of this paper is not to develop any therapy for people. The purpose of the pa uh, paper is where there are targets is available. You know, we can definitely uh, develop something that is very specific for Borrelia. Uh, that's what we thought. And then what happened? In this paper came out, and then people, because it, this drug is available in the, you know, the counter, you know, like, so they just got this loratidine and then started taking it, which is not a great. To your next slide, I believe, is where you were headed um, around. The yes, uh, this is the one. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. I'm so sorry for the technology issues. We're glad to have you back. We'll start yeah. right here. Okay, yeah. So, sorry about it again. Uh, so, uh, in this slide, you see that uh, manganese level, we, we also measure, we take those Borrelia, we, we uh, you know, you, we measure the manganese level. With desloratin, you, you see the amount of uh, manganese is very, very low, uh, much lower than uh, wild type control. So this proves our hypothesis. The next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, so coming back to the high throughput screening. So it's kind of in silico screening. Uh, we do saw some uh, possibility of developing therapeutics. We are kind of encouraged by that. But when we saw that this molecule is causing a like, lot of liver toxicity, we slowly moved on to another molecule or few other molecules because uh, we don't want people to be all the time having some toxicity because of this molecule. So we just went back to our high throughput screening. We wanted to find out anything that is possible, a better molecule than doxycycline, better molecule than other uh, molecule that people, clinicians are treating. We are kind of wanted to equip them with good molecule uh, to your clinicians, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, so it's, we, we, are, we are kind of doing a supportive research. Uh, in this, this is the 20, the top uh, molecule. Uh, some of them worked well, some of them failed. Mainly, we wanted to focus on two great molecules. We are very happy about this molecule. One is uh, disulfram, the top one. The di disulfram is uh, it, you know, it's kind of, we are repurposing it because the FDA approved reasonably non-toxic molecule. Uh, people with an alcoholic addiction, they are using this molecule. Then you see in another molecule, it's called azulocylene sodium. Very recently we published a paper, which yeah, it, it, it again warns me that the internet is a problem. So anyway, uh, so I will just go quickly. So this- So Dr. Rajatis, I think what I'll do is I'll turn off your video up. Oh, I think we, and yeah. um, that might help. Um, so let me turn that off for you. Um, and then I think that maybe that will help with the connection. Okay. Um, I think sure. I can do that. Okay, now I'm, I'm back, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so then the next slide, please. Uh, yep, there we go. 
Next slide. Yes. So uh, this slide, uh, I just want it's you know you all you have a log face Borrelia culture. I explained what is log face earlier, and also you have a stationary face. I repeat, what is log face? Log face is the nutritional plenty and the molecule. You know, Borrelia is keep dividing, and then in this case, in this density of the Borrelia, that is the bacteria, we treat different concentration of the drug and then try to find out whether we can kill uh, the borrelia uh, with various con various drugs the top of our 10 select molecule we always uh, uh, treated with mitomycin mitomycin is an anti cancer drug it's not a great drug for for any clinician to give it to borrelial patient it's a very toxic drug but this, you know, uh, early researcher like uh, Dr. Kim Lewis, he published a paper to show Borrelia is perfectly, especially he thinks the persisters are cleared by mitomycin. So we always use as a positive control. We wanted to develop a non-toxic molecule that is as good as mitomycin or better than mitomycin. We are yet to find a molecule better than mitomycin. We are, we are getting molecules that is okay when you comparable to mitomycin. That is, as, uh, you know, azulocelin. And we always compare it with negative control we call is a doxycycline. Because if you see this slide in the top, both in log and also in stationary state bacteria, you always see some bacteria is left in the presence of doxycycline. Even at high concentration, people can argue uh, doxycycline is only a bacteriostatic, it is not bacteriocidal. Uh, people argued with me like that, but doxycycline at higher concentration do kill a bacteria in other cases very clearly. But in Borrelia, what we found out, uh, even whatever the high concentration you did increase for the uh, uh, doxycycline, it always leaves some live Borrelia in the culture. So what it means to, uh, you know, somebody having doxycycline as their treatment. So these individuals, of course, uh, doxycycline is going to reduce the Borrelia load in these people. But based on this result and what, uh, you know, my colleagues, Dr. Monica Embers already showed that this treatment with doxycycline is not going to remove totally all the Borrelia, at least in 15 to 20% of the people. Uh, maybe, you know, those people, even though they are thinking that they are cleared of their Borrelia culture, Borrelia load in their body, but there is some amount of Borrelia is there. We don't know. Maybe that is the way it is, you know, it is causing the disease. At least in a primate model, Dr. Monica Ember showed there exists some population of Borrelia even after prolonged treatment of uh, you know, conventional antibiotic, including doxycycline. So what we found out, you know, with at least in a culture, and also I will show you our results in animal model, we can totally eradicate this Borrelia uh, you know, uh, by these two molecules, that is azulocelin and disulfur. So this is our focus, you know, try to develop these two molecules so that it can equip the clinicians to treat patients so that there won't be any lingering symptoms, they will not come back. And, you know, as I mentioned, we are, it is possible to treat some people with the lingering symptoms, like even five years, 10 years, 15 years patients, treat with one of these molecules and then see whether they can come, you know, regain their uh, their uh, condition. So this is what uh, uh, we. So the next slide, please. Yeah. So next slide. Uh, you know, uh, we also uh, because we are also interested in the mechanism. A similar molecule called cefetoxime acid. So we treated with cefetoxime, and uh, we found out that. You know, at about, you know, if you treat this uh, bacteria uh, in the presence of 
uh, this antibiotic for prolonged time, they can totally eradicate uh, the bacterial colony. So this is what we found out. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so then, um, uh, you know, the one of the lead researcher in my team, uh, uh, his name is Ravindra Potanini. Ravindra Potanini came up with an idea that why not we, you know, we take, uh, we treat this uh, doxycycline with the Borrelia, and then this Borrelia, always you have this remaining some amount, right? So he developed a protocol to take the persistent bacteria in a dish. That means you spin out those bacteria, then you take the bacteria and treat with the doxycycline again, and then treat with acylosaline again. So what he's trying to find out is, like let us say an individual exposed with good amount of doxycycline, and still they have a lot of persistent in their body. So whether it is correct to treat with doxycycline again, or you just treat with another good molecule like azelocelin, we found out. So that's why he wanted to recapitulate that scenario in a dish. So he, he, what he do is like he cultured the bacteria in the presence of doxycycline, whatever they left out, and then he take those bacteria and then try to grow them uh, in the presence of azelocelin. As you see in this figure, azelocelin 20 microgram and 40 microgram concentration, they always reduce. In fact, the azelocelin at 20 and 40 in, you know, 10, they're treated with 10 microgram grown uh, bacterial persisters, all of them are totally vanished. What is interesting, what is interesting is even in a stationary state, you know, as I mentioned earlier, stationary state is much difficult to kill, you know, in a dish, even in a dish, because the way they design is they are resist you to any back, they shut down uh, all, you know, like kind of all, uh, all kind of drug uh, diffusion to their membrane. So there is no way, and also they are metabolically inactive. When you something is metabolically inactive, it's very difficult to kill them because generally the drugs get into the bacteria, they di disguise themselves like, a, you know, some of the molecule the bacteria is uses, and then it go and then binds with the, some of the enzymes of the bacteria and inhibit them. But if the bacteria is not taking anything in, it's impossible to kill them, right? That's what happens in a stationary phase when that the bacteria is kind of shutting down, you know, especially in a persistent state, shutting down the metabolism. So, you know, you don't get a good traffic there to kill them. But what, what is interesting is um, uh, in a do 10 microgram doxy persisters in this slide shows Azelocelin at uh, you know decent in, in a log phase is totally killing them, but in a stationary phase also it is reducing a good amount of uh, bacterial load, and the doxycycline is failing, and the doxycycline resection is also failing to clear them as good as azelocelin. We do have some left out in a stationary phase, uh, but uh, you know those kind of left out less concentration like few bacteria, I think they will be, uh, they, you know, easily cleared by uh, the immune system of the people once you re remove the minimum load that is necessary for the people to get better. The next slide, please. Yeah, same thing um, with, uh, you know, this is also very extensive study. We wanted to find out if the structural requirement of the azelocelin is the Main reason we took an analogous molecule of cefatoxin and we tried to find out, we saw the similar behavior even though cefatoxin is less efficient when compared to azelocelin. But uh, we do see a trend, yeah. Next slide, please. Yes, so, uh, you know, th this is again, uh, we call it as a azelocelin challenge. Uh, we take, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, azelocelin at 20 microgram, the persistent uh, 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 formation, which is fortunately not heritable because the persistents are not like a resistive strain. They are revert back. We call it as the reverters. They revert 
give it back to the normal bacteria uh, uh, structures. And these, uh, you know, the persisters, we take the persister, treat with the mazulosilin with the 10 microgram and 20 microgram and 20 microgram per ml, all these eradicate this persister totally. Yeah, that's a good news. The next slide, please. Yeah, so this is again, you know, we have a 20 microgram, 40 microgram at different time. As you see, like around, uh, you know, uh, 96 hours, all of them are gone and nothing is there, but always you have azulocilin, um, you, you have a doxycycline uh, with a different concentration. They are totally not totally clearing them, but you always see with the 20 microgram, 40 microgram of azulocilin, they are cleaning. So you can ask why not, um, you know, doxycycline also very high concentration. Doxycycline, very high concentration like azulocilin, you can't use it uh, because at that concentration, it will show up some toxicity. Doxycycline, so azulocilin, even grams, you can take it. It's, it's kind of, non-toxic molecule, whereas doxycycline is not. You can have like 100 milligram, 200 milligram, but whereas people already, uh, you know, used azulocilin like grams, one gram, two grams. So it's not, uh, you know, it's, there is no comparison with that toxicity profile. Azulocilin, much less toxic molecule when compared to doxycycline. The next slide, please. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, um, I, it's a borrowed slide. Uh, if you see that uh, Borrelia, uh, it's a, as I mentioned, uh, it also shell out some lipidic uh, structures uh, when they move through the tissue and uh, that structures can cause disease. I mentioned to you, I also mentioned about our paper, but Borrelia is also smarter, like many microbes. Uh, we found out, uh, one of my collaborators actually, we collaborated with a group in India, they found out Borrelia uh, specifically, uh, you know, inhibit uh, some uh, factor called factor H, which because of that, OSPC is inhibiting C3 convertase, it's a complement pathway, so one of the immune system is involved. So that means this immune system is extremely important. That means Borrelia have the ability to alter uh, the complement system so it can evade the immune system because this complement system is also tied with our other kind of uh, innate and also peripheral uh, systemic immunity. And this particular process, when it is totally stalled by Borrelia, and it, it is likely to have a lot of effect in our immune system. So that means we have, you know, it appears that because of this, Borrelia can develop a lot of inflammation. It's not a, like other bacterial infec infections. See, like, as I mentioned, earlier, like we do live with bacteria, like in the way wild type mice is living with uh, uh, Borrelia. Uh, like we have plenty of bacteria in our body, in our gut, it, it is beneficial bacteria. We learned how to live with them. So they are not toxic. They are not creating disease to us. In fact, they are protecting us. In the case of Borrelia, because it is interfering this kind of uh, complementary evasion, and also immune dysfunction, it is causing the disease. So that means the molecule we develop, it should, number one, reduce the persister level. Number two, it also need to protect our immune function. So this is our focus. So with that focus, we try to find out uh, whether our second candidate, Dysel from, can help us with that particular thing. And to our surprise, we found out that disulfiram not only disulfiram is not only removing uh, the Borrelia persistent Borrelia, it is also trying to bring back the immune system back to normal, uh, reduce the inflammation. That's amazing. Uh, what, I mean, our finding, even though uh, unlike. Azulocilin, doxycycline do seem to have uh, 
have some side effects, which currently we are dealing with that side effects, how to avoid that side effects. But the fact, what we found out, the surprising, pleasant, surprising fact, we found out that disulfiram can clear the persisters in the dish and also to some extent in the in the in vivo model we are dealing with. Most importantly, we found out it can revert back the immune function in these people and neurological function in the, the people. I mean, we think we can extrapolate whatever the data we have in animal model data we can extrapolate to people. The next slide, please. Yes, so, but that is the one problem. The problem is, disulfiram is basically, in an anti-abuse, uh, basically it's an anti-abuse molecule. The people with the alcoholic addiction, they use this molecule because when they take alcohol, they always generate acetaldehyde. And then acetaldehyde is, basically aldehyde dehydrogenases is converting acetaldehyde, which is very toxic. It causes a lot of pain in the body. And then aldehyde dehydrogenase is making them acetate a relatively non-toxic molecule and disulfiram is kind of inhibiting it. So the, the effect what people alcohol is, is in case they are tempted to do alcohol, they generate a lot of aldehyde and then aldehyde causes they feel horrible actually because of this fear when they are on disulfiram, maybe some people are even for several months, year, they just take disulfiram regularly. And uh, so th that's why they avoid you know, alcohol. And then they, they get protected from alcohol uh, because alcohol addiction is as dangerous than any ad other addiction. So they are a kind of hypersensitivity but the problem with this therapy, if I give, we give the disulfiram to patients, you know, for Borrelia to remove the Borrelia, uh, but they are likely to have a sensitivity to alcohol. So they need to learn how to at least live without alcohol till they finish their therapy. The next slide, please. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, 80 to 90% of the disulfiram. It's a very simple molecule. Liver metabolizes this disulfiram. Unfortunately, uh, it is a very fragile molecule. When the way our body, they, you know, it's like people always compare with another molecule. Very good uh, comparison is hydroxychloroquine. It's a molecule which people think it can help a lot of people. Unfortunately, this molecule, they stay in our blood forever. That causes a lot of problem, toxicity. By disulfiram, at least the prodrug form is uh, generally, you know, get easily metabolized. But the toxic metabolites of the disulfiram stays very long time, 120 hours. That's very bad, actually. Uh, so that means if somebody takes disulfiram, they have to avoid alcohol for a few days. Uh, so that's very bad. Uh, you know, it's not like you can just uh, get away with that because the metabolites also inhibit all the dehydrogenase. The next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, all this path, you know, very, uh, very extensive uh, thing where you see how the all dehydrogenase is involved. The next slide, please. Yeah, I'm extensively telling why, um, uh, you know, why disulfiram is kind of not a great molecule, uh, but it is the only good molecule we have to deal with the chronic uh, Lyme disease. That's what uh, you know the data, the animal data suggest. But if they've got a, this kind of problem because it is non-specifically uh, um, you know, inhibit a lot of important enzymes. The next slide, please. Yeah, this, uh, as I mentioned, the prodrug is our main drug. So we have to develop a formulation that is maintaining the prodrug because we found out the metabolites, what we see, the bottom metabolites, uh, we call it as a ditch C. This molecule is not only it is toxic to cells, our mammalian host cells, it is also not clearing the Borrelia. The next slide, please. Yes. 
So uh, you can see the similar curve. Uh, and of course, even though at high concentration, it, we found out aggregates of uh, the prodrug, so it's failed to kill at high concentration. But later, now we know how to avoid that high concentration aggregation. We are ready to publish the data, but we figured it out how to deal with that. So it, uh, you know, even at the low concentration, it, this was again shown by Kim Lewis and other people, my collaborators. They, it's very good in, at least in DISH, it is clearing the persistence. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is again, you know, an extension of the work. Uh, same thing, the next slide. Yes, so this is the most important. How do we know uh, Borrelia, this treatment is non-toxic? So as I mentioned to you, we have this animal model C3H, and then we treat the Borrelia with this animal model, and then we see what happens. Uh, what we do, you know, if you see the Borrelia BB dogs group, you see them, lot of cells, you know, darkened spots there. That means a lot of inflammation is going on there. That, so in a heart. So this is all the sections of the heart there. Borrelia infected, doxycycline, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, saline, phosphate buffered saline treated animal. This phosphate buffered saline, there is no treatment. You see a lot of dark uh, size spot. That means every dark spot what you see is immune cells. When the immune cell get into the heart, that means the heart is already inflamed. It's not good, actually. So it's not good uh, with the saline. But when you put, when you treat them with the doxycycline, you do see some amount of inflammation, you know, pending inflammation. But when you are just, when you look at the doxys, uh, di from treated animal, you see their heart is much better, you know, closer to the control, uh, uninfected control. Uh, it is good. That means disulfide from not only clearing the Borrelia, but it is also making the heart, especially heart, non-inflammatory organ. This is very, very important. So uh, I don't know how many of you are aware the people affected by coronavirus, they develop an inflammatory disease called ARDS in their lung. That's why they can't breathe properly. Uh, so people, the mortality in coronavirus is because of the inflammation caused by the, in, in the exposure of the virus, multiplication of the virus. So same way, we also found uh, Borrelia, at least in animals, it leads to an inflammatory disease. The inflammation affects the heart. Inflammation affects the brain. And uh, we need to find out a therapeutic molecule that can not only clear the Borrelia, it needs to be clear the inflammation also. This is very, very important. We think this 15 to 20 percent of the people, they develop a chronic disease because of the initial inflammation triggered by the Borrelia. This is what we think. Maybe persistent bacteria is still alive. We don't know. But one thing is very sure, based on our in vivo animal model work, we know these animals at least, they have the inflammation for a very long time, the lingering inflammation in their very long time. To our surprise, what we found out, treatment with disulfiram can remove this persistent inflammation, not only removing the uh, persistent bacteria, it also removes the persistent inflammation. The next slide, please. Yeah, this is again a reversal of the immune function. Uh, so we look at the IgA, we look at the IgM, uh, we look at the IgG. We took all these isotopes and then we try to find out what happens. Uh, we found out some, you know, it's not a, like a dramatic in the way we saw inflammatory markers in the heart and other uh, areas. But we uh, disulfiram, when compared to disulfiram and compared with uh, doxycycline and PBS, it is definitely reversing our IgA and IgM to the normal level. Uh, that is for sure. It's not like, uh, you know, we get totally a control kind of situation, but they do have a trend. We are 
dry cell from treatment is reversing back to the immune function. The next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, other molecules, um, like, uh, you know, some of the molecule in the brain. Uh, I, as I mentioned, you know, we are more interested in the brain because, you know, previous uh, speaker also uh, talking about the brain fog, we wanted to find out, we can find some molecule responsible for this brain fog. As you see, TG, TNF alpha is very high in the brain. Uh, you know, the, uh, both, the, so the doxycycline, the blue colored thing you see, it's not reducing the TNF alpha, but disulfiram is reducing. Same with, with the IF and uh, gamma, uh, you see disulfiram totally removing it. IL-6, another very bad inflammation marker. In fact, for a coronavirus to remove, uh, to totally prevent uh, 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 the, uh, you know, ARDS, the terrible uh, lung uh, disease people develop because of this infection, they are proposing to give an antibody to these patients so against the IL-6. So that means if you reduce the cytokine strong, uh, either for a Borrelia or a coronavirus, if you focus your therapeutic molecule towards it, you can definitely help uh, these patients. That's what uh, you know, our data suggests. So, and again, uh, our previous speaker was mentioning about the induced NOS, and in induced NOS is reduced uh, when, com you know, when, uh, when compared to doxycycline, uh, you know, Borrelia treated with the disulfiram. And uh, so, uh, another interesting uh, signaling molecule, which we think is involved in the brain fog and the body pain, that is ALDH5A1, uh, that molecule also we see some interesting behavior in this molecule. We are yet to finalize anything. We are working on it. Uh, the next slide, please. Yes, so this is again uh, different immunomodulators. We quantified uh, in the heart also with RT-PCR. We do see transcript of MIP2, RANDS, TNF alpha, iron. So all of the inflammatory markers, a panel of inflammatory markers, they are highly upregulated. We do see uh, a molecule called IL-10, and uh, this molecule also getting, uh, getting upregulated. That's a problem. Because a subset of tissue closer to the Borrelia seemingly uh, show non-inflammatory level, whereas the overall body is likely to have an inflammation. So the Borrelia, it appears is a very, very smart uh, uh, organism. It just to create a non-inflammatory region around them, but it creates a systematic inflammation, maybe by shelling out that lipidic particle. We don't know, we are working on it. The next next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the, again, I am going to the thing because I'm almost close to the my time. So uh, the next slide, I think this is the last slide. That is the last slide. Yes, yes. Thank you very much for uh, listening. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Okay, great. So we have your audio. Um, I've turned off your video, but we can still hear you. Um, we're wondering if you can comment on um, the correlation of Lyme treatments and COVID-19 treatments like um, hydroxychloroquine, um, azithromycin, and ivermectin, um, the antibacterial antiparasitic that's been found to kill COVID-19 in the test tube for, in 48 hours, um, but has been used in Lyme treatment since 2010. Are you seeing any, any uh, correlation? Yeah, so uh, as many people agree, uh, I, I think uh, Dr. Zhang is uh, authority in this, uh, much better than me, uh, but as a you know a drug developer, I'm also interested in hydroxychloroquine treatment. I do believe uh, it's a very good treatment option, even though some people are concerned about uh, the toxicity it is creating to people. Um, but um, I really think it's uh, you know it, it is very promising. Uh, I think uh, you know uh, like uh, currently. Uh, we, many of us, we just left everything, whatever we do, we are trying to develop a therapy, possible therapy, uh, not only hydroxychloroquine based therapy, we are also working on few more therapies, 
so we wanted to put as much as uh, possible uh, uh, options for people so that there won't be any uh, lack of medication also some people uh, like you know maybe you are aware a lot of people are anecdotally taking diesel from now uh, 20% of the people they develop a uh, lot of side effects for those 20% of the people like the chronic patients i mean we need to develop some other therapy you know diesel from is not going to be the final final therapeutic possibility there is there need to be a several therapy need to be developed in parallel so that we we need to address all the population not one subset of population perhaps hydroxychloroquine uh, chloroquine will work in some set of patients or majority of the patient but still mo- both in terms of drug availability and also therapeutic options we need to at present with with leaving everything out we need to all focus on developing as much as possible as much combination as possible so that people clinicians have options to choose the best one Great, thank you so much, Dr. Rajatis. Um, and then just two more questions. Um, should disulfiram be used at the time of the tick instead of doxycycline was one of the questions. Uh, uh, so um, I, I, I basically, I don't want people to take this as a clinical advice. And I am not a clinical uh, clinician, but like Dr. Zhang, I am not a trained clinician also. I'm not a practicing clinician. so i'm not supposed to give any advice people should not take my advice as a clinical advice so based on our uh, animal work uh, we think we think it's only based on our animal work we think uh, diesel from is better uh, to for people with uh, post treatment like you know you try with a good antibiotic and then you fail uh, because still they have a lingering symptom in spite of the antibiotic treatment for those people based on our pre clinical work there is a possibility they can get better uh, again i am not a clinician people should not quote me that i suggested this uh, so there are uh, much better antibiotic at the first time antibiotic we recently published a paper on acetylcholine so uh, instead of i think uh, you know people need to find out an options not just doxycycline other better molecules you know uh, like people like uh, dr ian the few molecules and i am developing few molecules uh, even for the acute line when people show up and then instead of using a, a, a traditional antibiotic people need to find out whether for certain patients they can treat with some other antibiotic instead of doxycycline so that's possible so it's more like a personalized medicine approach need to be taken instead of trying to prescribe like everybody you know this molecule uh, so again we need to do a lot of clinical trial we need to conclude that and we are currently uh, one uh, one company they license this molecules both the molecules and they, they are developing they are getting ready for a clinical trial All right, and I think our last question we'll end with is um can you speak speak briefly about the mechanisms for the side effect of neuropathy in patients with Lyme disease taking the sulfuram and how to mitigate those side effects. So uh, that's a great question actually. Um so as I mentioned what, what we found out when the borrelia is we call it as like you know it is a slow dividing organism. but at the same time it it <clears throat> it give away a very inflammatory lipid particle uh, around them so these particles have a very good blood brain ba- penetration and you know maybe uh, all of you are aware that um, our neurons specifically they are very lipid rich uh, uh, cells uh in fact they have more cholesterol in it more lipid in there it's more lipid actually in the brain if you see when compared to all other organ there is more lipid there so it is very natural when this lipidic particle come out of the borrelia they all get into neurons specifically because like ghost likes like you know they like so they they 
pass the blood brain barrier at the same time it get into the neuron so it is possible uh, that's what we showed in our paper yeah, lipidic particles get into the neuron and uh, the neurons we we can show like how the synaptic damage happens how the neuronal damage happens by exposing this particle so we think uh, if we can avoid in the in by an antibiotic prevent this bacteria when they are dying not shelling out you know the bacteria how they die is also very important uh, like in the way when we kill the tumors uh, they develop a therapy to ensure the tumor never get into a necrotic pathway you know they need to die peaceably they need to die in a way not create lot of cytokine strong like in the way the viral load you know it creates cytokine strong that's why people develop disease so when the tumors die they should not create a cytokine same way when the borrelia is treated it should not produce lot of cytokine storm it should not produce any cytokines to trigger a perpetual inflammation in the body then people need to deal with that inflammation that caused by the antibiotic itself so um, that's our approach basically so the number one why uh, what is the approach of preventing the persistent disease to prevent or reverse a condition if they are having a lipidic particle triggered disease number one number two if, uh, if <clears throat> when people are treating with uh, uh, bacteria with antibiotic we need to develop an antibiotic that will prevent the cytokine storm when the bacteria is getting cleared up so that's another approach both the approach we are trying to find out whether our candidates qualify that uh, maybe they are we are we are we are in the process of looking at it very carefully well dr rajatis we cannot thank you enough for all the work you're doing on the front lines for infectious disease and um uh, the it's so promising i i follow the dissolve from uh, facebook group um and uh it's just so so encouraging to see um people getting some relief from all the great research you're doing so thank you so much um, thank, you. thank you for battling the tech issues today and continuing to be persistent um in your ability to get back into the call and also your persistence and continuing to battle Lyme disease um and covid um for us on the front line so thank you so very much um thank Carrie, you I'm thank hand you very over much. to you thank you thanks a lot Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rajatis. It was it was a pleasure to listen. Um, thank you for everything that you were doing. I, I know you're juggling right now, and so your time was very much appreciated while you were with us today. Thank you so much. And thank, well. you. thank you. Thank you.